68. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our next major milestone is 200 Patreon supporters. We are only 68 members away from achieving this goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off Catoctin Creek Custom Rods. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, members-only content, weekly Patreon supporter giveaways, and so much more. For more information, click on the link in the episode description or click the link above my head. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. One. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we are heading back to, you know, that that lake that if you fish in this region of North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, you're probably going to have a regional, a BFL, an AB, something on Kerr. And we are here with the first, this guy won the Piedmont Division at Kerr this year, Jonathan Crossland. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me, man. I, I really appreciate that. You have a absolute stellar credentials, you know, just looking at the MLF side or the old FLW, because I still like to call it that. I mean, you've had, you know, these two fantastic wins. You've had over $86,000 in winnings. I, dude, how did you get started in this crazy sport? So I was in the Army, um, you know, going back, I fished up. I fished growing up like many of us do. Um, didn't have a boat. Um, I was in the Army. I got back from Afghanistan in 2008 and uh, bought a boat, started fishing some tournaments and decided, hey, I, I really like this. I mean, I've always dreamed of fishing professionally. I mean, that that's the end goal for most of us. That's what we want to do, right? Um, I just, I love fishing and that's what I always want to do. So got back from Afghanistan, bought a boat and decided, hey, maybe there'll be people that can help me out along the way. And that's how the sponsor game started in a I get to this point now and I'm extremely blessed that I have super good support system, uh, not only at home with my wife and family, but uh, really great sponsors, man. And uh, they, they, they take care of me. They, they support me. Uh, they support my decisions, whichever way I decide to go. Uh, they're, they're always there for me. And, and what year was that? Just to put a little time stamp on that. 2008. Okay. 2008. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, I got wow. out of the army in 2010. And that's kind of when it really, I really started focusing more on uh, going to get my brains beat in in the BFLs and stuff. Because I never fished as a co-angler. I, I, oh, and really? I definitely suggest anybody that's looking, young guys, if you're looking into getting into this, go fish as a co-angler first and learn some things. Because I took a many of beatings before I started figuring out how to cut a few checks. Why did you do that? Like out of curiosity, you decided to go straight to the boater side versus doing the co-angler route. I just uh, had a boat and I said, I'm, I'm just going to go fish. Stupidity, maybe. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did fish uh, before I jumped in the opens years ago. Um, I did fish one year uh, as a co-angler in those. I, I traveled with uh, Brandon Cobb and Jamie Rampey and was Brandon Cobb's link and I they, just that year just that year watching Brandon in practice man I learned so much about how to break down a body of water fast and how to pattern fish it, it uh I just can't emphasize how important it is to to go be a co-angler first and, and learn a little bit it, it just takes the learning curve out of it it is intimidating especially when you get to these bigger bodies of water and you have to break them down the first time and I think that's the thing that a lot of seminars and things like that don't really tell you is it's hard to go to a, like your very first time without any type of preconceived notion e- even if you've been there once that helps a little bit um and so getting that when you're going on as a co-angler it is a really good learning opportunity i agree 100 in, in 2008 there were some other things going on in the world like a housing crash and it really <laughs> did affect not only everyone but the fishing industry um how hard was that to then try to navigate not only fishing in, in like the semi-pro circuit, but also finding the sponsor thing? Was that something that was just 
it kind of worked out immediately or is that something you had to really grapple with? So, you know, I shifted my focus and my focus has kind of always been more uh, non-endemic local local companies that that help me. And that's that's where I get my biggest portion of monetary help um, It is local companies that I've made a relationship with. Um, they have typically larger budgets than a lot of endemics. And then not everybody's pulling from the same chunk of money. Right. So I don't have, I'm not competing with other anglers typically to get these marketing dollars. Um, but 2008, I, I was just really getting started. So I didn't, it, it really didn't affect me any. I, I was just starting with the product deals and, and things like that. And I had a few small, um, you know, Jersey spots sold and a decal on the boat, but you know, no larger, um, contracts at that point. Wow. So in 2008, you try to get into this crazy sport and you start, you know, just trial by fire. You're getting into it. At what point did you feel like you started to feel like you belonged and you could go out there and compete? Uh, you, you know, started things start like many others in, in club tournaments. Um, 2000, I want to say 11 and 12, uh, I was in a club and won angler year back to back. I, I was winning a lot of those club tournaments and starting to ca cash checks and BFLs. Um, and then what really, what really kind of, you know, I started, Hey, I need to try this. And then, so I jumped into the Toyota series and, uh, you know, got my teeth kicked in for the first couple of those. Uh, those boys are no joke. But in 2019, I believe it was um, 18 or it might have been 18. It might have been 2018. Um, I cut my first check in the Toyota Series. So that really gave me the confidence to realize that, hey, man, you, you really can compete. You're not, you know you're better than just catching fish in your local lakes. Like you can travel and you can go catch, catch them. It, it really is. I can still remember my big win when I had an ABA victory. I think it was 2016. I, I won an ABA on the Potomac and open and it really solidified. Finally, like it wasn't a team tournament. It wasn't a college event. It was a legit event. And even though it wasn't a Toyota or an open series, like, Oh shit, I can actually catch him. I don't suck. Right. And that is so important for a confidence because you have that thing to like rely on. Um pivoting now to really, I think your first big one would be Lake Murray. And before we get into that event, like what what is your history on Lake Murray? Was that would you consider your your home body of water? Yeah, I live 10 minutes from Drew Island. My um from my front yard, I can see the lake. I live right across the street from Lake Murray. Um met my oh, cool. wife on Lake Murray. Uh, Lake Murray is a special place to me. Um, but I had a love hate relationship with Lake Murray, um, for many years, like all the tournaments would come like in February and that is not my greatest time on Lake Murray. I mean, I, I can do okay. I can catch, but you, when you're fishing against these local guys in, in February, if you don't have 25 pounds, you're, and even back then before the lake blew up, like it is now, even back then you, you got guys that will just rip you to shreds. And and I was always doing okay and a cut a check here, cut a check there. Uh, but it was kind of a love-hate thing. I always wanted tournaments to come, you know, a little bit later in the year when, when I had the fish figured out. Um, it wasn't such a tough transition for me. It, I, I would consider it's probably easier for you. And so my personal experience being a, a Virginian, you know, we are tidal water pretty much unless you live down closer to Smith, Kirk, Aston. You, you get the the – the connotation that you're a river rat, uh, and, and yeah, I was, and to be able to get to the national championship, I, it went through title. I think it was the upper bay the first year and we got to go to Murray. Dear God, going to a blueback lake for the first time that got my ass kicked in three ways to Sunday, but I had preconceived notions because I was fishing high school derbies. I fished title my whole life. Was that, was that blueback deal easier for you? Because you were kind of like you were new to angling and this was your blank canvas. Yeah. For me, it, it really was, um, you know, I've always heard the stories of when Hydrilla was all over Murray and 
they were catching 30 pound bags and but i learned you know during the the blueback days you know from 2008 even through now and um, so learning the blueback it's still a learning process i learn something every time i go out about how they relate um use cover to ambush bluebacks how the bluebacks move how how the fish have become nomadic um when they're relating to bluebacks and then you take that and you go to up the road to to hartwell where it's a spot lake and it's a completely different thing you know it, so the way a largemouth you know relates to blueback herring is a little different than the way a spot does and this the areas they'll set up on so it, it it took a long time to learn it and learn it good where I really feel like I understand it. Um, but it, I think it was easier for somebody like me who didn't, didn't already have that background of fishing grass and fishing when it, they were using the rock piles and the, the, the deep brush like they, they used to. Do you feel like the blueback are more of a factor at Murray than, than Hartwell? Cause it's interesting that you say, yeah, Hartwell is more of a spot place. I've fished Hartwell and Kiwi before in college, and I kind of agree with that. And I've always wondered, like, they both have blueback, but they are different. Uh, I think, you know, the, the spotted bass just outcompetes the largemouth. Um, I agree. That That's why you, when spots become prevalent in the lake, that that's what happens. They get in there and they kind of overtake it, and the largemouth just kind of move away from their old areas. So if spots were to start getting in Murray, um, I, I think the largemouth, they, they just kind of change their patterns. I, I don't think that, that it kills them. I, th I think they're still, cause you can still catch good largemouth at, at Hartwell. In fact, I want to, um, yeah. I think it was in, tw well, lead in 2021, um, the, when I qualified to fish the regional that was on Lake Murray that I won, the, our, the super tournament was on Hartwell and I had. I finished top 10 there, but hmm. the, I had like a, I think it was like a five something first day largemouth, one big bass. Um, wow. And they were, it was running with spots. So, it, so it, was, it was super weird, man. It, it, and I'm glad you brought that because it's like really hit something in my head where it, I feel like Murray is one of the few blueback centric lakes that is pretty much a pure largemouth bite. Because when you think bluebacks, it really coincides with a Lanier, a Hartwell your spotted bass that that is interesting how that is set up that way at murray it's interesting yeah i don't you know th there's a few spots i've caught a spot on on murray and i've seen people catch some uh, smallmouth i've seen smallmouth weighed in at tournaments damn yeah. but we just don't have many of them uh, that's so yeah. weird yeah, it, huh. it is pretty weird so, I mean, go, going into it that then, you, you, you've you been able to take your punches. You got to Lake Murray. Uh, I think it was uh, it was a fall tournament, right? It was October yep, 2021. Yep, 2021. I think it was the 8th through the 12th or four, 12th through the 14th, somewhere first, like first part of October. And uh, – Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you know, that one leading up to it, Prask practice was amazing they were suspended it was I mean, you could catch them it, it was really good but the water came up and during practice for that event i was actually catching them on a frog um, and that's what i went and did the first morning of that tournament and i had one blow up in two hours and and i started realizing i got to looking at the water level and i was like the well, water's dropping so knowing you know much like and we'll talk about Kerr. And, and how I, you know, kind of came to the same conclusion there over the weekend. I, I knew them fish were going to be pulling off the bank. So I started running brush. First brush pile I get to caught like a four pounder. And that's what I, I did every day, all three days. Um, I, I, and, and man, that one was just so crazy. I, you know, you hear stories about when it's your time, it's your time and that it, it, that rings true for me because I was fishing a brush pile and some fish come up schooling way off to my right on a, on like a top of a shoal, like a herring spawn type deal. Hmm. And I go over there and I throw, I throw my bait and it one eats it. And I'm like, man, it's a striper. 
Well, I get it to the boat and it's a, like a four and a half pounder and it's hooked by one triple hook in the belly. Oh my God. So man. I get it in, I get it in the boat and the going into the final, I had a, I was down, I was in third, but was down seven pounds. The dude, I mean, the dude that was leading, I think he was from your, up your way, Virginia. Well, I mean, was throttling us. I mean, he was whooping us and, uh, and then Andy Wicker, who is a Lake Murray hammer, was in second. So I, and he had, you know, a three and a half pound lead on me. Wow. So it was like, I was, when I, when I finished my limit and caught a kicker on that last day, I was just fired up. I was like, I'm, I knew I made the All American. I was like, man, I made the All American. And, uh, it, it just, I, I get to the, to the bag line and you start looking and Andy didn't have them. The other guy had like one fish, and I was like, "Whoa, this is crazy!" And I had a a huge crowd there. My, you know, I, I text my wife said, "Hey, I got a pretty good bag." So she rallied the troops and all my family, neighbors That's so there. Ah, cool. oh, dude, and uh, it it was man to to win one at home like that and a big event like that is I can't put it into words. It, I mean, it's still just one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me. If you, because it seemed like going into the last day, you weren't going to win it. It was, that guy's got a great lead. Did yeah. you fish more relaxed? Like, all right. Oh, I, I, did. I did. I didn't have any, winning it wasn't even a thought, really. So I was just, there was no pressure. I just went and ran, ran what I knew was holding fish and just took my time and made sure that I made accurate cast and, yeah, <laughs> it, it there was no pressure on me. It, it, mm. it really was a, a relaxed, relaxed day. Did that go into your decision making, or was it just I was just going to do the same thing day one and I did day two, or based on what you saw day one, and knowing like I might not win this thing, I'm going to do this. Yeah, when I went to that first brush pile, um, and caught that four, I mean and finished my limit out and had a decent day. And then the second day I had 17 something pounds. I had committed after, even after that first day, I was committed to, to do, I, there was enough fish on the brush hanging out around the brush that I knew I could catch them either on top water or pick up a drop shot. I mean, I knew that was my best shot to, to make all American. And that's, that's exactly what I, what I did. Yeah. That, that to me is always interesting. That mindset, especially in multi-day events, which is so much different than, normal stupid BFLs where it's, you know, do you maintain a lead? Do you protect it? Like, how do you go into it? I fished two, two day events. That's really stuck in my mind. The first one, I was in third place the first day going to the second and it messed with my head because I was being way too conservative. I was like, let's just go do this. Let's do that. And I fell out of the standings, I think to like 10th. And then the other one, I was like on the bubble going into day two and I didn't care because I knew I couldn't win. And I ended up going up a bunch of spots with how I fished. So it's yeah. so interesting when you have multi-day events that the psychology as, as an athlete, basically, and the decisions that you then make compared to like, if you're winning the decision that you would make that, that is fascinating to me. And I, I think some of that comes with just experience too. Um, you know, I think as as you get more confident, and as you as you probably you know, maybe it's just getting older. You you just become more relaxed. Because I I mean I used to be pretty keyed up when I was young. You know, lose my mind if I lost a fish, and you know, you get to a point where hey, um, what's going to happen is going to happen. I'm a man of faith. Um, so in, in my opinion, it's there's nothing that I, I can, all I can do is prepare the best I can, put my work in, and uh, God's going to work out the rest of it. And that, that's just, you know, that's what I believe. And so for, I just, I, I don't get, I don't get that nervous anymore. But I, funny thing is I can go fish a, like at the All-American, last day at the All-American. I, I had no jitters or anything. Um, first time I ever fished a bass open, you know, with all those big names, never had jitters, but give me a, local little derby here on Murray where all my buddies are fishing. That's the only time I get jitters anymore because I don't want to hear them. They put a whooping on me. <laughs> I don't want to hear I don't hear them messing with me for the next month. <laughs> As we pivot to the, to the Kerr event, what is your style? Would it be more of a pattern or a, or do you like to just work an area? Because I really want to answer that question to we talk about like how you broke down Kerr. So, 
you know, a little bit of both. Um, I'm probably more of an area fisherman than anything. I, I do like to find an area and try to maximize that area if I feel like the right fish are there. Um, you know, on a blueback lake, that's a little different. You know, you, you got 50, 60 spots you got to hit in a day sometimes. Breaking down, like, you know, are you going to just fish an area, a pattern? Do you like to graph? Um, I know, like, with a lot of those Carolina lakes, especially like Hartwell and Murray, it's a lot of graphing and finding the piles and stuff and and, and getting that that homework and that work to have a, a playbook to be able to go run 50 spots. I think it's funny because a coach I had in high school talked about running and gunning and having that. But what he didn't tell you is like, well, you need the waypoints to actually go run. You need to actually right, put the work right, in right. to find that shit first. That's and right. Murray is your home place. So when you're going to Kerr, which is you know, a pretty big lake, how much time or experience do you have on that to have that playbook built up? So this was my fourth time at Kerr. So, I mean, I've probably spent, you know, I fished the open there last year. Um, so that was a good experience. And I fished a, a couple BFLs there in the past, had one top 10, but doing pretty much the similar, I mean, every tournament I fished at Kerr, I've done the ex exact same thing that I, w I won doing. I just pick an area and it, it it's all been time. It's all been this time of year. You know, the open last year was on was a little bit later than this. Um, but every tournament I've ever fished has been around this time of year. So I kind of knew it'd be a pre-spawn spawn deal. Um, you know, first thing I do, I really love sight fishing. Like I love sight fishing. So from February through probably mid-May, the first thing I do when I go to any lake is I try to go find spawners because I, I absolutely love it. Um, so every time at Kerr, I've never been able to find any spawners that, you know, are going to do much for me. So I had made the choice to, well, if they're not up on the bank, they're not spawning, they got to be waiting. They got to be ready. They got to be doing it somewhere. Um, so I, I just backed off to secondary points and I start, looking on secondary points, uh, using live scope to find brush piles, rocks, you know, individual rocks that they're hanging on. Um, and that you mentioned, that is, you mentioned areas Lake Murray is about, I think 48,000 acres bugs is about 48. They're about the same size. That's a big ass lake. Um, compared to like a high rock that has a lot of BFLs, which is like a pond comparatively right, to it. Right. You can run all of High Rock if you wanted to in a tournament. Right. It is a Murray or a Bugs, especially like Murray because you've experienced it. Is that so big that you really shouldn't in a tournament run the whole damn thing? You should pick an area to run? 100%. You can waste more time. I mean, it, uh, um, I got these motion lights in here and if you're not moving around, they'll cut off. <laughs> um, but yeah, when you get, I don't like to waste a lot of time running. Um, so that's why I like to pick an area and maximize my time. If I feel like the right fish are in that area. Um, I don't see it happening to you too. Yep. Uh, but there's times where you need to make that move. But I think a lot of guys do get caught up in, especially BFLs like history. You know, they catch one in a bush, say it curved yep. on a point, And they're like, oh man, I, I caught them. I caught them last year on these bushes, you know, in grassy. So now they go make a 25 minute run up there and they get there and it ain't happening. So then they're like, well, I got to, you know, a lot of guys just get caught up in running. And I, I think the the biggest thing I've learned is you just got to fish the day and every day is going to be different. Um, I mean, you can figure out where they're at, but just like on, on Murray, you know, where I probably told you I was practicing today for that law enforcement tournament tomorrow. Just because they're set up right here today, they may set up in a completely different spot tomorrow. I mean, they're going to be fairly close, but because of the wind direction may change or, you know, just because they want to move over there. Sometimes I feel like I, I don't so, – sometimes it doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> change things up. But, but I yeah, I really do like to to pick an area and maximize that area if possible. One thing that really comes up with bugs is the amount of pressure and something I, I would pick your brain on too here. We're going to talk about your term as well, but you fish the open and it seems like in the springtime, there's about 38,000 clubs that have an event at bugs. <laughs> uh, 
on top of that, you fished an open that already had a shit ton of people. Like, did that place fish small for the open? Um, yes and no. I mean, everybody was kind of spread out. I mean, it's big enough. I mean, you think like Nutbush is a is a lake almost in itself. So, I mean, if that's where a guy decides to fish, I mean, he can spend all day in there. Um, and there's other places like Grassy and, you know, even Eastland Creek. You, you know, that's a pretty big area. You can spend a whole day in there. Um, so it really didn't fish uh, small for me. But again, I, I was doing something. I never found the shad spawn like apparently everybody else in the open did. Um, so, uh, and that one, I should have cut a check in that. I mean, I wouldn't have top tinned it, but I had the fish on to, to have a, a decent finish, a top, probably top 25 finish. Um, and I don't know. I've just, I, I feel like when I come to Kerr and it's spring like this, I'm just going to focus on those secondary points. For me, it's, my style of fishing. I understand what's going on and uh, I go look for the other stuff. I, I really do. Um, I was so looking forward to go flipping bushes. You know, the water yeah. was up, but I got there last Thursday and come, you know, the water dropped and come Friday, the water had dropped a, a pretty good amount. And I just knew that th those fish probably weren't going to stay shallow. And some guys caught them shallow, I'm sure. Um, but I would go shallow and I would catch some fish, you know, shallow, but they were a pound and a half. And then I'd go back out, you know, in that mid range, that, you know, 10 foot range, and I'd catch three pounder. So I was like, well, that's definitely what I need, need to be doing. You know, with that stated and, and you fishing primary second points and you coming from a blueback, like, were you going to be targeting a blueback bite specifically this time of year? I mean, I know we're probably a little early for a blueback spawn, um, but I guess that kind of goes into the type of points that you're looking for mindset wise. Yeah. You know, I, I did kind of look for that and focus on that. And I did catch some on this uh, queen tackle prototype head. Um, it's a roller type head. It'll be hmm. coming out. I believe we're going to launch it at iCast, um, still messing with the prototypes. But you could see where the how the eye is bent in like that. I don't know if you can see that on the camera or not. Yeah, move it a little bit towards center. Other right. way. There you go. All Perfect. Right. Yeah, there you go. So can you see how the eyes like in line with the hook shank? Yeah. Well, what that causes is that bait to roll like this. Huh. So I caught several fish on that. Um at current it kind of keyed me in on the the, the fish were kind of roaming and then i was like well they're roaming on these secondary points so there's got to be some setting up on brush rock and that you know then i started then i you know put my live scope to work and started you know catching some on, on the brush was it really coming down to just sniping individual fish or is there a pattern that you were able to run? Yeah. So most of my fish came from out of brush. So that was the pattern. I, I got on secondary points and found brush and those fish were, were staging in that brush. Some, How? Rock, some, I caught some off a of rock, you know, a few individual, like larger rocks, but. How hard is it? And this is a thing with Kerr, and I've talked about this on the show, Ignazium. Um, I think it was it was it was Bryson last year that said like you're looking for those Kerr unicorns, those four to five pound fish. And yeah. I don't think there's another lake, maybe the Ohio River, where a kicker is so valuable. It's so hard. And if you guys have never been to Kerr, you can catch ten pounds and nine pounds every day with half a brain in a Ned rig easily. It's that next class. Are you moving constantly to just to specifically, I need to catch this in the, in practice? Yeah. So I caught, I was the fish in, in practice. I was catching were averaging two and three quarters to three pounds. Um, so I knew I was around fish that I could compete. You know, I didn't think I was, you know, I knew I would need a couple lucky bites to get to, to pull out a win. And, uh, that first day of practice I was up there, I, I'd caught a 5.5 five on a point um, on this roller head. 
that prototype roller head. And I, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. There are some good fish. Um, and the day of the tournament, I caught a three and a half, um, out of a brush pile and ran around, caught, you know, I had a limit. I think I had a limit at like eight forty five that morning, but Damn. I had shook, a, I had shook a lot off, you know, the day before. And the first two I caught were like 15 inches. And I looked at my co I said, uh Oh, Bubba, I think I shook off a bunch of babies. <laughs> Might be in trouble. When I catch, I catch that three and a half pounder and then I, you know, some twos. And then, uh, I had, I had one, you know, I, I threw to the brush pile and working through the brush pile. I don't get a bite. And I see it, see my bait fall out of the brush and I see a fish follow, follow it down. Well, it doesn't bite it. So I, I back off just a touch and I throw this roller head over it. And that, that fish just shoots up and eats that roller head. And it's a three and a half. Um, mm. And then at one thirty, I pull up to a brush pile and I shoot. The, I was so here's what I was using. I was using a quarter ounce big bites uh, fin twist head. So perfect. Uh, huh. And I was pairing it with a Strike King uh, shimmy stick, green pumpkin. Um, that's just what I like to throw. Uh, I don't, you know, it's spinning or bait caster. A uh, bait caster and contra, seventeen pound contra. Oh wow! So Shit. I was using heavy line because um, yeah. I had to get out that brush. You know they they were they were tucked in there pretty good. Um, so I, I pull one thirty. I pull up this brush pile. I didn't even fish it in in practice. It was something that that I had found last year during the open, and I was like, well, it just sets up perfect. I pull up, I throw the cast out. I, I throw bomb my shaky head out there, lift up on it. I set the hook, and I, I know it's a good one. So that's a four twelve. And I culled out a one eight with um, so you talk about the 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 difference there, right? So I mean that that gave me three three pounds. Um I mean I still would have had a good bag without, you know, a good bag at Kerr. Um, but you hit the nail on the head at, at a place like Kerr, it's one fish typically yeah. that that can change, you know, it goes from a, a fifth to, to a win. It, it, it it's so bizarre because I've always been curious, like a place like that versus a Lake Champlain, tidal Potomac or Murray, where there's a shit ton of quality fish in it. How does that change your practice style? Because I know some guys that'll be like, they'll catch a limit and then they're locking a glide bait or a jig in their hand at curb because you need just one bite yeah. to separate yourself. What kept you to feel like I'm just going to stick with this versus doing the classic change to something else to swing for the fence? That five and a half pounder I caught in practice. That five? Yeah. I, I knew... I knew there were some females, you know, moved up, hanging out, staged up. So um, I, I knew if I hit enough spots, eventually, I mean, my chances were good to get get one good bite. If people want to be better at fishing brush, and again, I think I think this is where, you know, if you're listening, whether you love it or hate it, LiveScope is a tool. It's a very great way to, to sift through data and, and to make decisions quickly. Sure. How long are you spending on a brush pile before you bounce, generally speaking? You know, it, it depends if there's a lot of fish in it. Um, I, I may change a bait, but I typically, within eight to ten casts, if they had bit, they're probably not going to bite. And I'll move on and come back. I now, think that, that's, that's different. That's different on a place like Murray. Mm -hmm. now, you know, Kerr, when I'm fishing brush like that, you know, Murray, I'm maybe five cast. If that fish hasn't, if this fish haven't come up out, out that brush and, and eating the bait, then they're probably not going to, probably not going to do it. How long until you go back to that place in a rotation? Uh, like a non-Murray place? Uh, it just depends. I mean, sometimes 25, 30 minutes, sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes... Wow. Too. It, it just depends on where it is in my rotation. It's funny because it it's a tale of two lives because people that live in your area that come up to the Potomac. I I, I had travel Travis Donaldson on. Uh, he's he's good at high rock places like that, and he went to the Potomac for the first time, and he's like, "This is insane. The amount of congestion in these creeks. Like, how the hell do you fish like this?" Right. But you take a guy on the Potomac who's used to camping in a grass mat for six hours. 
and you take him to Murray or Kerr where it's like you're hitting 180 spots, mm-hmm. it's a completely different. It's culturally different. Right. It really is. Yeah, it. I am not. And, and guys do it here on Murray. I see it all the time. They'll sit on a point all day. Um, you know, they'll find a point that's got some good fish on it. And they'll sit there all day and wait for them to school. Or I, I just can't do that. I'm, I, I feel like my chances are better. You know, I kind of see it like odds of it, right? The more places I hit, the more fish I can put my bait in front of, uh, the chances of putting my bait in front of a fish that maybe not has seen a bait that day is better, um, as opposed to just sitting in one spot and waiting on those fish to come up or just keep con- repetitively casting to a spot. I mean, I, there, it's definitely there's times that, that that's a good strategy, but for me, that is not not how I fish. I, I just <laughs> I can't do it, man. I, I got to keep moving. It's 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 hard to do. It, this is what really the 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 super like top tier guys that they can do both. They can go to Florida and be like, I'm going to power pull down and sit in this grass patch for ten hours, and then the guy that's that same guy can be like, I'm going to run a hundred mm-hmm. bush pile. Like it is. I truly believe it's a cultural thing that you're grown up doing one or the other, so it's just it feels natural and you have those instincts. Uh, and an instinct you had was seventeen pound test on a shaky head. Is that hook a little bit stouter? Because I feel like generally, if you've never done that before, you could bend out a shaky head hook if you're yeah. too heavy of tackle. Yeah, big big bite baits is known. Um, you know, they're from U- Ufala, Alabama. Um, recently, they sold to GSM, uh, and I think s- some of the the um, production is being moved, possibly, or the headquarters now is going to to Texas. But baits are still being produced in in uh, Alabama, to my knowledge. Um, but they are traditionally known for for big baits. I mean, they they use stout hooks. Um, like I said, that the owners, it's, it's around Lake follow. So that brush pile offshore bite is something that, that they know probably better than anyone. That is such clutch because it, it's, we've talked about this on the show a lot. When I talk to my, my small mouth guys, my small mouth kayak guys up in small mouth country where I live about BFS and, and the idea of bait caster finesse. And that's more of like a style where it could be an ultralight bait caster, or it could be in theory, throwing finesse style stuff on bait caster equipment. Um, on the title Potomac spoiler, the shaky head and the drop shot is really king in a lot of tournaments and it's throwing it on more of a bait caster system. Mm-hmm. Is that something you've always done or is that something you've adopted over time? Yeah, I've kind of adapted to that over, over, you know, the last, maybe four years. Um, my, and a lot of that I, I tribute to, uh, my team partner. I fish something called the Carolina bass challenge, which is a big skeeter trail down here. And I fish it with a guy named Scott Beatty, who's a really good Norman, uh, fisherman. And, uh, he, between him and Jeff queen, they, they taught me that, man, you can throw a shaky head on big line. You don't have to throw it on eight pound test. Every time you throw it, the fish still eat it. I mean, you, and I just feel I have that confidence in that bigger line that whether I'm in a brush pile, whether I'm skipping a dock with it, whether I'm around rock, I just, I don't lose as many fish. Yeah. I may not get as many bites as a guy throwing it on eight pound test uh, for sure. I probably will not get as many bites as that guy, but 99% of them are coming in the boat. Do, do you feel like the shaky head is starting to, take the place of a jig, uh, especially if you look like back, you know, five, six, seven years ago, do you feel like that's more prevalent in your arsenal? Yeah, at times for sure. I, I probably, um, I probably do throw a shaky head more than a jig as I'm looking at rods. I got a shaky head and a jig <laughs> on right there. And I just enter, you know, I mix in between the two. Uh, you know, when we're talking dock skipping, you know, and, and I let the fish tell me what they want. And one day it may be a shaky head. One day it may be, maybe a jig they want more. Um, I just yeah, I let it, the fish fish tell me w- what they want. You have to, and then but there's also that trend thing about you know the pressure. Let's just be honest here. When we only go to certain lakes and that's it, it's really hard to 
throw the same techniques you've been doing the last five or six years. You have to adapt. And, I, and at least it seems when I interview people in the in the region, you start to see these trends going to different, more finessey stuff. Not always, but you know, of course, the jigging minnow uh, for mm -hmm. for the highest levels all all the way down to to, to us. What you did at Kerr, dude, I mean, absolutely astonishing. 17 pounds, which uh, again, you know, for the Potomac guys and stuff like that, yeah, it doesn't seem like much, but for Kerr, that is a hell of a weight to, to do there. When you caught that five pounder, did you think you had it in the bag at that point? Or were you still thinking like, I cashed a check? Yeah, I, I knew I was close. I mean, I knew traditionally, I mean, I, I know a lot of people that fish Kerr. Um, I, I look at weights a lot before I go somewhere so I can kind of have an idea what uh, traditionally, you know, wins or top fives at a place. So I knew I was close. Um, but no, I, I just kept, I, I kept, I had a two, two and I was like, I gotta get rid of that two, two. I gotta get rid of that two, two. I need three. Um, just kept after it. And then when, I, you know, and, and you're fishing, I mean, you're fishing against guys like Tyler Trent, David Williams. I mean, Tyler mortgages his house on that lake. <laughs> he, he's amazing. He's amazing anywhere he goes. Like, yeah, I fished the CBC. Him and his dad came down and fished the CBC on Murray back in February. I had 18 and a half something. I didn't even cut a check. And Tyler comes down, drops almost 22 pounds. He, uh, Gosh. a couple years ago, regional on Murray, you know, he, he won that one down here the year after, uh, I won the regional on Murray, he came down and won that regional. I, he's just good wherever he goes. I mean, the dude is a fish catcher. It's, it's insane what he's been able to do. Tyler, if you're listening, I got to get you back on the show this year, uh, for whatever tournament you're probably going to end up winning. Yeah. <laughs> you got this in your pocket now. What's next? Is, is there, are you going to be just poaching the BFLs? You can try to fish all the BFLs. Do you have another series that you're really looking forward to that you're competing in right now? So I was signed up to fish uh, a division of the Opens this year, and I was going to fish a division of the Opens and then a, the Central Toyota Series this year. Um, my wife had an, had an accident back in January and had to have surgery on both hands, so that caused me Oof. to um, have to drop out. Uh, kudos to the guys at Bass. I called, um, I called Hank Weldon, and no hesitation, man. They, they jumped right on it. They gave me laid out what my options were. Um, same thing, Mark McGuire at, at uh, Major League Fishing. You know, no hesitation to refund my money, and uh, you know they're they're they just want to make sure, you know, my wife was okay and was going to be okay. Um, all my sponsors the same. They're you know they're that's their concern. You know, making sure that my, my wife's okay and and everything's good here. Um, so I'm fishing the. I, I decided to come and fish the Piedmont Division because their regionals on Clark's Hill. So. The last few years I've been doing that. I've been picking divisions to go fish that have regionals that I feel like I can win. Uh, last year I fished a division. Uh, I think I fished the, maybe it was a South Carolina division I fished last year, but their regional was on Lake Norman. Um, I barely, I mean, I was like five ounces, I think, out of the cut to for the final day there. Um, so for me, that's been the best strategy is rather than just fishing you know, the South Carolina division going wherever that regional is. Um, Clark's Hill is a blast from the past. I don't think I've heard that since Davey height. Like I, I, this is the one issue I have with bass and stuff where you go to the same place 78 times in a row, yeah. like Beaver Lake and FLW days. Like is how is Clark's Hill fishing in general? Is it fishing? Good. Okay. Yeah, it's fishing. Good. It's been real good. The last, last few years. Um, I mean, I, they just had the Mr. Clark's Hill tournament. Um, a couple of weeks ago, and, and I believe it was 22, 20, 22 a day, somewhere around that one. A buddy of mine finished third and he had 20 something right at 20 each day and finished third. Um, so yeah, it's fishing and it fishes in the fall. Like the way I like to fish, um, you know, it, it, it'll be a suspended type bite. And, and that's what I feel like I'm the best at. So I decided to, to come up there to the Piedmont division to make that regional. And, and you say suspended fish. And, and now it feels like this is the question I have to ask people, uh, especially in this day and age, how, how hard was it for you to not just 
grasp but run with the the forward facing sonar and it's not crazy but just the technology um it was it a hard adjustment no i mean for for me it took i mean i spent a lot of hours learning it but it is i mean it, it has made me a better fisherman for sure um it and not because oh you know i hear you know you hear people say oh well you know you, you can't catch them if you don't have forward facing sonar, we were still catching them on Murray before forward facing sonar. It just makes you so much more efficient. Like when I'm brush pile fishing, I can see immediately if that fish is reacting to my bait. Um, it's made me understand how they relate cover, uh, especially suspended bass and how they act. Uh, it's just been an awesome tool for me to help understand the bass better and make me more efficient. Um, do I feel, I mean, if you take, if it goes away tomorrow, do I still feel like I can go catch them? Can I triangulate a brush pile and, and still put my top water over, over the top of that cane pile? Yeah, I can, but it definitely, it has helped me for sure. And, uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that big of a learning curve for, for me. Uh, again, I first, when I first had it, I didn't use it like I needed to. I look back at like, Toyota Series Championships I went to back in like 2019, 2020, and I'm like, man, you're an idiot. You had forward-facing sonar, then you didn't really use it the way you could have been using it. And uh, once I really learned how good it can be, um, I, I really, I mean, I knew that I had to learn it. And then, you know, I was lucky, man. Troy Morrow, a really good friend of mine, kind of, took me under his wing and he taught me more about Garmin live scope. And I mean, he, he could have charged me tons of money. <laughs> you know? He should have probably charged me tons of money for what he did. Dude, he taught it's me. a lot there. And, and, and when I say this guys, for, cause I know I have a lot of people that don't have it. They're thinking about getting it. The setup is easy and there's some micro adjustments. It's more about understanding what the hell you're right. seeing That's and, it. and separation. Um, What's your Garmin setup right now? Are you fit? How many monitors do you have? How do you have it set up? So I run one, I run a LVS 34 Ford um, with a 1022. And then I have a, a 106 SV with a 32 that I have in perspective. So I'm running two, two live scopes up front. I'm I, so I have, I have, I have a 34 for just straight on scoping, but, and I have a, um, I have mega 360, but I'm starting to hear from friends that the perspective mode actually kicks 360's ass. Yeah. I had 360, um, on a boat, uh, several years ago and 360 was great for, you know, finding like brim beds, things like that. It really, you know, it pop, you know, you could see the, the fish in the brim bed. It really popped. But for as much as I'm moving around, the only thing you know, only thing I didn't like about 360s, you know, having to wait for it, you know, yeah. the transducer. Whereas this is a live, you know, what I'm seeing is happening right in that moment. It just helps me understand what's going on better. Jonathan, I, I really can't appreciate you coming on the show. I, again, guys, you know, he absolutely killed it at the, the Piedmont division, 17 pounds, and I think four ounces on on the dreaded Kerr. You survived that. You got Clark Settle to look forward to. Uh, please, do you have any sponsors or anyone that you'd like to promote? Yeah, uh, so Lou Strike King, um, you know, I, I came on board with them after I won that regional. They brought me on board. Um, I, I was using their rods and reels well before i ever signed a deal with them uh, they take care of me uh, great rod and reel reels in fact they have uh something really cool going on right now the uh virtual tournament they have uh so check it out strike king you can find that on their their strike king page um, or i shared it if you if you follow me but uh, and then andy andy uh montgomery did something on it yesterday so that's a really cool thing they got like sixty thousand dollars in cash and prizes up for grabs um so really cool cool things they got going on um Lifetime Cabinets and Countertops, they've been my title sponsor for, this is the eighth year? They've been wow. my title sponsor. Um, so again, like I had mentioned previously, you know, non-endemic uh, local people um, seems to be the, the best option for me. 
when it comes to larger sponsorships. Uh, I also have a um, Tometo Spine and Pain, which is a, a local chiropractor, um, takes care of me too. Um, but it, Lou Strike King, Queen Tackle, Hardcore Fishing Game, which is my, my apparel company, uh, really awesome sun shirts they make with the hoods, keeps you cool. They're, they're kind of like a heavier material, but it, the, the way they make them, it just keeps you cool. Like the, it takes your sweat basically and turns that into a cooling mechanism in the shirt. So it is really cool. They're out of Florida. Um, big bite baits. Obviously I showed you the shaky head. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been blessed with, with people that really support me and I can't Dude. thank you enough for having me on here, man. I, I really appreciate it. Hope to, uh, hopefully I can win another one oh. this year. And we'll be talking again. Absolutely. And just even just talking about lakes and stuff and just, yeah, things that are going on at Murray, it's been a long time. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that with the, with the grass that's in there right now, it's really popping off and, and hopefully that place keeps showing out. Um, guys, you know, as always link in the episode description to everything that we talked about, please go support him. Check out all of his really cool sponsors. And if you guys would, you guys can just check us out on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and of course, YouTube, like, and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time on fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia and shallow water fishing adventures baits online located in mount airy maryland if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will